So you know myself well enough that you know that I have an obsession of apologizing before I start talking, so I will have to apologize for one or two minutes now first. <laughs> I, 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 you, you, like one of the most scary things is to, like, as an ethnographer is to give back what you've seen to the people that you are writing and thinking about. And actually, I've met four weeks ago a very famous anthropologist, uh, anthropologist who got famous for writing an ethnography and writing in the last chapter, just noting down what people thought that she wrote about, um, about what she wrote. And these people wrote famously, this is all total rubbish. And it's actually <laughs> totally different. And that made her famous. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> so um, um, that was a, um, uh, an ethnography about. Uh, is that Lucy? No, 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 that's not Lucy. That's, um, what's she called? I can, I, um, it's, the, it's the ethnography about Silicon Valley wives, about women like in the ni early 90s who are living in like housewives in the tech industry early 90s it's great, great. Um, so that's first apology second apology is um, this is not a talk and um, this is somewhere like pointing you know, like and I'm already using pointing towards a talk that I would have to give um, about the CDG in one week and um, the situation of this talk, it, or like basically my situation is after six weeks or eight weeks, six, eight weeks of research here, is that my original project, which I wanted to do, has been very fruitful, but I can't talk about it yet. The original project was that I learned something about the new medium that is emerging here. And I learn a lot about that, but I think I'm not yet there to talk in any kind of meaningful ways. I would just give very, very bad copies of some of the stuff that you do. So the, I go back to what we call in German to Schuster's Leisten, which means like to that craft which you know. And the craft that I know is I do organizational ethnography. So I look at how people work together and how do people other things together in normally in you know, shop floors or here in the lab. And I call this place for now the lab. So that's what I will give the talk about. Not about the amazing stuff that you're developing. I hope that I will be able to do that because I hope that I can continue this work with you and then I will also be able to work in a meaningful way to the products of what you're doing, to the outcomes and not only to the, what you're doing, the process you might say. So that's where I am. And last apology. <laughs> it's like, you're like it, you cannot imagine how deeply scary it is you're like sitting in front of these experts in visualization and you're like and you know all your little skills of visualizations fall apart so what I what I have to do is like I'm going going for the shittiest cha most chaotic form of visualization I have a like this is um, this is kind of like um, the um, structure of the talk as it is for now but I will have to cut some of it and I will probably mostly talk about this part the way the lab works and I actually don't want to always talk I also want to uh, then please at some point please overwhelm me and take over and you know then you give the talk to me so um, but the, um, there's three parts the first part is the way the, the lab works and here I'm trying to just describe how especially how and it's already getting diff difficult how the traces of collaboration in this lab come together how the lab comes together okay yeah so that's kind of like and how, how, how that is done via working together in different ways than normally uh, I think people work together and that's the interesting part here. The second part, people not projects, that's the famous Allen quote and here I'm not sure whether I will already talk about this in public, I could address some of the consequences of this principle of people and progress which is kind of like an alternative form of organization um, which also negotiates power here in the lab um, in a different way than normally or maybe not so different and that's to be discussed. And the last part, goals, could look at, I think there is two main goals here of the lab. One is really to practice a different and to show the world that there's a different form of R&D possible. And the other one, of course, is the outcome, which you could call a new medium. So I do call you sometimes medium makers. And I'd be very curious on feedback um, whether that is a description, a good job description for you guys, um, medium makers. But that's maybe like one of the things that media you media or medium? Medi medium makers, okay. because I think you all work like on slightly different versions of a medium, and not media in general. That's what. But um, you know, that's not so 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 deep thinking yet. It could be. You could convince me otherwise. Um, so. Um, 
obviously in the talk I will give a little bit of an introduction about like what the CDG is, so I'll scrap that because you know that. I will also give it a bit of an introduction of my um, stay here and I will um, tell them a little bit of exactly that, what I told you now, and uh, then place that only like, like in, the, in the literature. And basically, um, I came here not wanting to do a lab study because I didn't want to do another lab studies because there are so many lab studies. I mean, one of them is on Brad's um, table at the moment, Latour's fam famous laboratory life, and there's many been written in the, um, around that time and afterwards by many other people. But I think it does make sense to, ma to, um, to, to come up with another lab study because, um, well, I think because of two reasons. One is the simple fact that Latour is here on a poster and is on the tables, which means that normally lab studies, if you really cut a long story very short, then they always prove scientists think that they're looking for something which might be truth, but actually it's very much more complicated and it's, you know, like it's formed in the lab through the structures in the lab, it's produced. So that's what they prove again and again. You guys know that. So it's a different situation. It's not like someone can come into the lab and say like, hey guys, you're producing truth because you know that you're producing not truth, but a medium and you're using that. I mean, like that's bootstrapping. You're using exactly this production process to produce it. So this recursiveness is something that you know, it's not something new to you. So what's after that, after you have kind of research objects that you study that know that? That's the one side of things where I think it's slightly different what I do. And the other side is just like because of my background, I studied before the last big study that I did was with cashier women. So I, I have a different view at what happens to people than people who always, always had only looked at scientists. Yeah. So that's the introduction, and then I will try to start to describe how, how the lab works. And I've been thinking since a while about some kind of model, and I'm going to come up with a model now, and I'm going to also like undermine my own model. So it's kind of like a model that is in itself meant as a scaffold towards um, understanding what it is. But if you, if you, um, if you look at what's happening here in, in terms of how, w how the lab works, then normally you would start with something um, which people call cooperation, which you know, like has different forms of division of labor, and, um, and, 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 and that seems to be like happening not so much here. Like, I mean, like these teams where people, like everyone knows what to do, it happens a little bit more in the lively team and dance team, but it happens not so much. So that seems to be like maybe one part of the lab, but not the key, work, uh, key way into it. A looser word, which then often is um, um, suggested is collaboration, and collaboration is a looser form of cooperation where people don't integrate that much, but they just like come together, they do something together for a while. That's already um, 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 coming closer, but I think these, th this doesn't still hit. And for me, an important moment was when I think Glenn um, proposed that we talk here about deep work. And the point about deep work was that you've got to be alone in this. It's a long-term, pretty lonely enterprise where you go so deep into something, so concentrated into something for such a long time and with such an emotional, personal energy um, that you actually become like the only person who really gets it, that you really, really go deep. And that is something everyone said, in the end, you do alone. Okay, so that's kind of like not like that's something different than the, than the normal tale of what happened in labs because normally in labs like everyone should like cooperate and so on, but here uh, is this other story. So that's one story that I find very interesting, and the other story is of course one that um, that's I think always around in this lab and that's this idea of bootstrapping, and let's put bootstrapping here because it sits square. And it's a slightly different version of what you're doing because bootstrapping is something that, you know, like if you take the old Engelbart vision, it's, yes, it's not only collaborative, but it's mostly collaborative. It's about the recursion of augmentation. You augment to augment, you know, so it has. If you look at this analytically, then you have like here two, two things. On the one hand, you have a one to 10, let's say, of togetherness. Yes. And on the other hand, you have a, 
1 to 10 of internal recursion. Internal recursion means you produce the stuff with what you produce the stuff. You are familiar with this terminology. Please stop. So that's kind of like the model that opens up for me the space. But it somehow doesn't work. It's somehow too abstract and somehow too, like it doesn't, and, and I think we'll, we'll come to, to why it doesn't work in a second. I think it's also a visualization problem and you already probably see how I wrongly visualized it. I still haven't figured it out. So I, um, I at this point, would leave this for now and would just go, and that's maybe for, for sure you can like now throw stuff at me, just like a total, um, um, total random um, list, and it's really random, I have not mixed it, but it's really, I, I don't know what's going to come up next, um, of practices that are placed somewhere here. And I will later like um, show you why I don't think it can be exactly placed anywhere here, why it's too complicated. All of them are too complex to be placed. But some of the stuff, how the lab works as lab, OK? And here, please add if something comes to your mind. Does that make sense until now? Or is that, are you with me, or is this, yeah? So the first thing that I started to describe is something which I have the working title of auto-scaffolding. And I call it auto-scaffolding because it's in a position to scaffolding as it is in education. And what that means for me is like a triad of three things that you always do. You build representations, you build tools, and you build pointers. With pointers, I mean that which is not that what you, what you really want to build, but something that is somewhere in the way, that's pointing, OK? Um, obviously, a tool is something that helps you to get there, and representation is something that somehow describes what, where you want to get. And the point about this auto scaffolding, I think, is where it's interesting, is that you constantly swap the roles. So every representation also, in a way, is a pointer, also is a way in a tool. Every tool is also a little bit of a representation, is also a little bit of a... And this kind of like constant swapping in your own work and with other works, and in, uh, uh, that could be something like how work is. And I'm not yet sure whether this is a variation of prototyping or whether it's actually something totally different. You could, you know, this is like a question of definition. You could say that prototyping, you already got to know where you're going to go. Whereas in this process of representation tool and pointer, you can be more open. Um, so that's one thing. Does that make sense to you? What's the difference between the representation and the pointer? A representation is to me when Say Brad makes a presentation about the dynamic spatial media and say like that's where we want to go, and um, this is you know this is like the steps and this is where we, where we want to be in ten years. A pointer is um, in a way in certain apparatus to a certain way because in certain elements it's a tool for sure like it is it, there to to enable um, explorable explanations to to, uh, to to push them easily so it's clearly but it's also in a certain way a pointer. Um, because it points towards a form of organizing software that is not fully there yet in it, but that, want, that, that someone can see that it wants to become, and representation is actually representing it. So it's talking about where you want to be. So that's, um, but, um, but I'd be very happy to swap any of these words here because I'm, you know, with all these words, every word that I'm using here, I'm battling with myself. Is representation the right name? I know that Brad has a very interesting idea about representation and so on. You know, like you, this is um, something that I'm still battling. Really, like a no order here. Now it gets a little bit easier. A, a, a practice that I find very interesting is this practice of dropping, dropping in space. You just leave something. And that is sometimes just. You know, you leave a, Matthias leaves a poster. Sometimes it's, it's, it's almost like it seems to be like also like a very meaningful and conscious intervention. Vi leaves a little inst installation in the kitchen. So it's all sorts of forms of dropping where people drop their stuff and leave it and someone can take it up at their own time, at their own moment. And um, a very interesting and for me pretty unusual to practice. I don't, I have never seen this in any kind of way. Um, this is something. Reuse of idiosyncratic tools. I mean, all of you guys, you come, come with the history, and you come in, you've built your own 
pieces of software you bring them in here. Often these are very idiosyncratic tools. For example, Robert told me some of his pieces of software, which he totally has built for himself, suddenly became mean meaningful here in the lab. So they come from the outside and they start to blossom in, 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 in a meaningful way, even though they originally started as very tailor-made only for his specific projects. Totally unordered here, okay? So it's like, uh, because I'm not sure how, I, I try to order this many ways, but I, 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 I am still not sure. Shooting over rails, what I mean with that is that you guys, all, or many of you have visitors, and you represent a story about the lab. And I mean, probably you will tell me I'm not listening, but I don't believe you, because I think that everyone always gets these snippets once in a while, how one person, how Glenn presents the lab to a friend who comes over, and Pollock saying, oh, interesting, that's his vision. Because you all present part of your work, but you also present the whole lab. So there is a coherence coming out of, like a careful coherence coming out of you, each other, hearing, hearing each other present. But not in a full focus, but kind of like, you know, um, it's really like a shooting over rails. And I'd be very curious to hear from you how much you are consciously thinking about that your colleagues are hearing what you're presenting or not. And that's something that I will hopefully research later. What, what do you mean by, or like what is shooting over rails referring to? What's so if someone comes in, you present the lab, um, but, but, but this, the, for example, in your case, um, 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 your version of yeah, the lab. I mean, like, what, yeah. what are the literal rails that you're? Yeah, why is it called shooting over rails? Is it a train? Oh, that's just like. Um, um, is it a train? Is it a train? Okay, yeah. maybe a bad translation. In German, it's called überbande spielen, and then it makes sense because überbande spielen means that you indirectly communicate. You know, you, you don't like. So, so, so it's shooting over rails. It's, it's, it's <laughs> bad <laughs> translation. <laughs> maybe indirect communication is a better label for that. <laughs> Indirect sounds like so far. Like overhearing. Yeah, like overhearing. Yeah. overhearing, maybe. Yes, yeah. so that's something. So yeah. Or ambient or whatever. Amb yeah, ambient hearing. Yeah, that's curious. Yeah. 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 The metaphor is from billiard, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's from billiard. Basically, yeah. Billiard. basically yeah. I don't <laughs> shoot the ball directly, but you shoot it over one of like, and that's, the edges. And that's actually, you know, now that I think about it, it's actually the wrong metaphor. Uh, billiard? Oh, like billiard. Oh, instead of saying directly at the hole, you bounce it off of something. Yeah, bounce off and it gets the target indirectly. Ambient hearing slash I'm sure German translators are out I think ambient is, is, is the, there's something like, that's actually what I mean, because shooting is like, way you don't really present to someone else, you present to your guest. But I, I just assume that there is a certain form of, and, and, and this is because you're like, I'm asking myself, how can such a loose place get its coherence because it gets its coherence and it's a very important one but in, in a different way so yeah sorry inculcation in the whole culture yeah. because everybody's in this yeah exactly and but but you see like inculcation i think that's happening that's what i'm trying to get at but um, I need to break that down into smaller practices, what, how it actually comes, how, it is, how, how this work is done. So obviously, you know, I should not forget, but there's a very classical one, there's private friendships here. No need more to talk about it, but I think very important for this lab and its coherence. Um, there is um, there's a certain amount of auto-experiments that is quite bootstrappy. They are not fully <coughs> bootstrapping because they are not you know, like really going into, but I mean, you know the examples, for example, when we did watch deep, uh, the deep work and we tried to um, tag it in a new form of way, that's an auto experiment, you know, like direct application of some of Robert's thoughts into something that we are doing together. Again, something very banal, there's lunch and kitchen, but one thou shall never forget, and especially like, for example, in Brad's group, where I know it a bit more precisely, the Monday lunch, very important, very important and very interesting for me at the beginning, extremely awkward, always awkward at the beginning, but I think a very interesting form of social interaction, which I will need a lot more time to describe precisely, um, but um, um, it's a very loose and careful and um, form of public, um, which for, I, I'm very interested in these kind of like um, public forums inside the workplace. So I've done work before and I've, I just know for now it's important and it oh, works no, different to anything. Oh. <laughs> 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 we could have had hot tub. Yeah. Oh, oh, our version okay. of Monday lunch is like hot tub. Okay. <laughs> okay. But that's just a dream, no? No, no. 
no. no. There's, a, there's a literal hot tub oh, okay. that <laughs> See? we go it's to as a group and hang out. <laughs> it's also at my house. <laughs> so it's not, there's a literal hot tub. <laughs> There is, um, if you really go for the full vision of bootstrap, I, I'm not sure whether, I, like if you take it literal, you know, I'm not sure how much I find it. I find it at some moments, I, uh, but I mean like there was an interesting moment where you said like, okay, the lively people, of course it would be great if others would work with their software, but at the same time, clearly, this is an experimental software, no one else can build on it yet. So how would that happen? There is, I think, elements on this um, um, maybe coming when, um, when um, the LA group will, um, will develop uh, domain-specific languages here. But, but this like full circle of bootstrapping, not sure whether that is really happening. And I think it also probably one can show not, didn't even happen, happen in Engelbart's group the way that he described it. Because I think the field is wider. It's more like here than here. You know, like it's, and, 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 and I'll come back to that. There is, of course, the idea of deep wiki. I call this deep wiki. That's the idea of lively, which I start to understand and which I find an extremely complex and interesting social experiment in this one group. Then there is a practice that I find super fascinating, and that's riffing via email mostly. I know that mostly from Brad's group because that's where I see the emails. I'm not sure whether it happens in the other group. So riffing means one person comes up with a simple first idea and actually prototypes it. And about five hours later, someone else builds something that reacts to it and pushes, sometimes reacts to it, sometimes comments it, sometimes pushes it a bit further. Something that really I think um, I've learned comes out of improv is this yes and. You know, it's not a, it's not a controversial, but it's a yes and relationship. And I find that an extremely, you know, it doesn't fit. Somehow. It is a bit of bootstrapping in here, of course. It's a bit of collaboration in here, but it's like very interesting practice, this kind of yes and practice, which only works via email. It doesn't work in conversation because you need your five hours. Um, and you know, it's, it's obviously in this lab so important that the email strands are just as, just as importantly documented as the final project. So this riffing, for me, one of the most fascinating practices in the way that people work together. Again, you know, like I'm collecting the, the interesting stuff, but also the banal stuff, because um, that's also important to not forget that. You share tools, you know, a new laser cutter comes in at all sorts of the, all sides of the, of the lab. Someone is like trying to understand this machine, trying to do something, and there's some knowledge, some, 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 some kind of like it's a collaboration, something happening. I've heard, I haven't seen, but I'm sure there is, that um, you have practices of what someone has called deep feedback. Someone has said, I get here feedback on my work that is so deep, I can get it nowhere else. Yeah. Sadly, I've never been there when I was there. <laughs> so I guess like, I mean, like in a little bit, like in the, like for example, apparatus, was that already deep f feedback when we, when we uh, talk? I think it's more like happening in smaller private pockets where people really deeply engage with each other's pro project. I'd love to be there at some point. There's this whole culture of experiments, salons, films, reading group, and trips. And I put them all here because um, and each of them could, could be like, there's slightly similar, but also like different in their own way. Um, but that's kind of like different experiments of socializing. Does that make sense? Still? Yes, it's not so much anymore. Youth festivals is for me another really interesting one. It's coming close to bootstrapping, but, but again, it's, n it's not. For example, the Game Jam has this two level of youth festivals. First, you know, like everyone is using the hypercard in the world system, build something with it, then everyone is using the games together. So like a two-step process, um, however, not one that folds them back, because at the end you are at a game and you cannot use with that game, you cannot fold back into hypercard in the world. So it is a movement into a certain direction kind of like somehow dead ends, but gives some interesting um, ideas about use and uh, yeah. Then, just behind me, I think very important here is the Pantheon. The Pantheon, I think, to me mostly is the library. It's this kind of like, it's this Pantheon of gods that you all, like, you don't know it, but 
from the outside you have yes you have probably like 40 percent different gods but you have 60 percent the same gods i mean like outside of this lab it's not clear that papa is a god inside it's very clear that papa and alan of course you know you know so it's like um, so there are these gods or semi-gods um, that you all share and that um, they are here in this library but also interestingly in some alternative second libraries or in representations of libraries they are stabilized. It's also interesting that this library is Brett's private library I think that's also something it's very difficult for other people to put in other gods because this is your private library and it's like I tried once to put in a book um, but actually it got um, sorted out because it was already there and I didn't notice I put it and tried to put Jack Goody in as a small one's per personal god but it was already there so um, so it's an interesting stabilization this kind of like I mean like of course this is also a place to insp for inspiration and, and, and for, for sharing and, and you know like these gods are circulating here some of them like move into the center of attention but this pantheon I think stabilization is very important this one I talked already about I, and I think many Germans, find one practice extremely interesting. You don't say hello and you don't say goodbye. Like for, um, for me, that's hard. Like when I, especially when I leave in the evening, and I, uh, like to leave and not say hi, bye, which is just like what, it, like in Germany in the radical forms, people even say constantly greet each other. Like, and maybe you've noticed that I always try to smile and I can't stop it. I know that you don't want it, but I can't <laughs> stop it. <laughs> because it's so in me. And, um, and I think it's, I've like, talked about that with many people. I think there are other places like MIT Labs or something where similar practice are, right? but it's a specific practice. And the interesting thing is, it's just wrong. Hmm? <laughs> wrong. That, that is just wrong. I say hi and bye to people every day. But you or are hug them or like Emily, it's just wrong. Emily, Emily you do know no, that you have a, a special role in this lab. For yes, one of them is very, like very one of these reasons. Socially in this lab. Oh. Like the person who says okay, it's just wrong if you're talking about me. Never mind. Most <laughs> people would leave the lab and they would not say goodbye. Now this you can like read this in many kind of different ways. There's the stereotypes of, of like kind of like nerds and so on. But I think it's also a collaborative achievement. It's high trust. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, is that because you don't want to be disturbed by all this greeting, and you can trust each other. And I don't have the trust yet that it's okay. And I still. You like I still think oh they all hate me when I like this time <laughs> <laughs> because because I, but, but but you don't have to do this anymore so it's a collaborative achievement to not do certain stuff around sociality so I think that's a very interesting practice that's going on and also because the day doesn't start and end for us we're working all the time we're working on the way here and we're working when we're at home there's no ritual to begin and end our thought process. I, 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 and, 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 I, and I know some of this, and I will, at the end, like, I mean, I think there's, no, it's not here, but still this stuff is at the end of this talk in the sense of we should copy some of it, and in the sense of I find that also, on the other hand, so relieving. Like, when I come to the work, I'm full of thoughts, because I always, like, when I walk here, like, the thoughts come, and then I really like it that I can just go to my table and write it down and I don't have to bother with anything. So it is great, it's great. I, 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 I totally agree with this, but it's also weird. <laughs> um, I mean, like this is like the meta card, you know, obviously this whole thing is not never finished. You're constantly experimenting, you're lo looking for different forms. Um, there is one big card um, also here. Um, that you use the space as brain and you know this is like this whole way how you treat the space this public space and how you all work with um, and, and I still haven't figured it out this is longer work I, at some point I understand what are the laws who who like how is it decided that some um, whiteboard moves opens up, closes, how, how is that working? It's, it's a mystery, maybe it's a mystery <laughs> to you too. But no it somehow idea. works as a collective, I, I, I don't know, like at least in my, in, my, um, in my enthusiastic moments, I have a feeling that I'm sitting inside of a brain. And, and, and that's something, it's a, that's a strong semantic atmosphere that is evolving. It's of course has to do a lot with its uh, practices of dropping, 
but it's it's more, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm still there. So this is where I am. Um, so if I would now go, and then I we can maybe stop. If I go back to here, then obviously that does that still makes sense a little bit, but doesn't make sense at all anymore. Because if you try to put any of this in here, it should be able to be placed exactly, but you can't. And why can you not do that? Um, it's very simple, because togetherness and internal recursion, these two um, lines are actually much too imprecise. So what is togetherness? And like there's obviously like a different width of togetherness, different depth of togetherness, so you know what's what are actually what's actually being measured here. You know you don't know that, and even more in terms of recursiveness, you see that there is a tool recursiveness, but there's also an atmospheric um, recursiveness. There is there's some kind of like social recursiveness. There's a knowledge recursiveness. There's different forms of recursiveness that are playing out in this. So this thing here ha ha um, allows me to open it up, but it's not like it can't cover it. That's as far as I am about the way the lab works. And there's two more parts, but um, maybe we should stop here, maybe because I'd be very curious if there's here something that you want to add or, or disagree or comment. You can even say, like, this is totally flat and banal, which I think at the moment, right now. Well, there's a lot of interesting stuff here. Add to the ripping stuff we often riff by YouTube video. Oh, okay. So by posting on our channel, Emily will post something, I'll post something back that replies, but also riffs in the, the editing or the visual form. So um, right. It's on the right. Below the hot tub. <laughs> I'm just like, this is gonna, like I'm, I'm lost here. I'm just going to write this and for myself. So YouTube. Okay. Um, that's also, I meant that this is actually an interesting mix because that's what I forgot between riffing and the misnamed shooting over rails. I think the other one, form of shooting over rails that some, not all of you, give public presentations. I mean, there was this, there was this strange moment right at the beginning as an ethnographer. Um, you don't want to read too much documents in, in the, because you want to learn firsthand. So I was like, right in the first week, asking Brad some questions, and then Matthias said, well, you could look at his videos. You know, like, and I was like, oh, okay, I'm being told off. <laughs> but um, yes, that, um, 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 that is true. I guess that you also all communicate via the public um, communications of your work. I mean, like, it's, it seems to be like, clear when Vi does something that some people, at least in your group, and some people here look at it, and the other way around. But some people don't. So that's another form of playing. It's not the ambient one, but it's also playing indirectly, communicating back into the lab through the outside. Yeah. And yeah, I was, I was going to bring up that too. The <coughs> there's this, this weird fine line between public communication and private communication. Yeah. And I think like when before we had the lab and we were just kind of scattered, um, all of our communication was through public, um, you know, through like web pages or yeah. YouTube videos or whatever. And now that we have the lab, there's some stuff that goes out to the public, and there's some stuff that's kind of kept internally until it's ready to go out to the public. Yeah. And um, this, yeah, something kind of interesting there, I think. I think there's some, that, yeah, and maybe to add on that, there was one person who said something very interesting to me that riffing um, in the dynamic group has actually maybe declined a bit since the. Um, um, since the installation, uh, what's it called? I just, uh, the, the, the research gallery. Hmm? The research gallery. The research gallery is there because you know now that you're going to be displayed in the research gallery, and you're like a little bit more observed. I, gu I guess like riffing. I don't know, but there is something about riffing in privacy and riffing in public. I, there is, there's a very fragile relationship, I guess, um, that one has to be like carefully look at. You know, because you, if you know your joke is going to be archived, you. Um, Okay. Riffing, of course, has a lot to do with jokes, and that's, I think that's some of it is extremely fun. Is there anything else that's missing or wrong as a description, or would be, or do you see a wonderful way of ordering this? I, I can't. <laughs> well, the dropping goes with the brain into space. 
dropping goes with that. Like, yeah. I feel like that's part of, that's like yeah. a function of the space of the brain. Yeah, I can, of course, for my talk, I can develop a little bit of a narrative, but I think there are so many dimensions how this works, and I think that has a lot to do with these two forms of internal recursion. And with internal, by the way, internal recursion, I mean as opposed to recursion that happens anyway, because technology develops. Internal recursion is that technology that's built inside here. Okay, shall I talk a little bit about the last two? I, I, I probably will not, um, this is already enough to talk about the first presentation, but I can give you some thoughts about um, these two things, and that's really like very unstable yet, uh, still. So one, shall I? Just quickly. So um, people not projects, it's a fascinating pro principle. And if you read that with an anthropological view, then you translate it into a different kind of language and you, um, you, come, you come to a term that's called, that I would phrase clientelistic meritocracy. Now, meritocracy is clear what it is, like the best people, and it clearly works. I mean, you guys, it's an amazing, um, amazing um, um, like, um, um, bunch of talent in this room. And normally that's opposed to clientelism. Clientelism is corruption. Clientelism is mafia. It's the theory of that where friendship counts more than achievement. It's, it's, it's an anthropological theory, okay? So what I think this works here, it somehow manages to do both, yeah? So that's the first interesting thing. The second th interesting thing, I think, is um, what is clientelism exactly? If you look at it from an anthropological point of view, it's chains of friendship, asymmetrical friendships, where there is always one patron and then clients. So you could, like, like in a place like here, there's a formal organization, and that is important. Okay, so you have contracts, and in these contracts, you know, like it says how much money you earn, what title you have, and some really important stuff like copyright stuff, and there is a formal head of the lab, and, and so on. That is one side of it. But in any organization, actually, like real life works in a different way, and it very often works with clientelistic friendships. So that's the way power power works.